So uh, hello, everyone. Um, as you heard, I'm a PhD student at, here at Oxford. And yeah, this is kind of my fun way of procrastinating my actual PhD research by doing something that feels productive um, and fun for me because I just talk about uh, film and television, which is something I've always loved and continue to sort of pursue on the side of my PhD research. So let's uh, jump right in. So let's talk about two movies that came out in 2019 to kick this off. So the first one is Cats. And Cats is kind of remarkable to me because, well, it had a budget of 80 million pounds. It had all the stars and yet it has among the worst reviews I've ever seen of any movie of all time. Um, well, here are a few of my favorite ones that I came across. Oh God, my eyes will haunt viewers for generations. And my personal favorite, a doctoral thesis could be written on how this misfire sputtered into existence. So another movie that came out around the same time that you may have seen as well uh, is Parasite. And this movie was made on a 10th of the budget and it's considered one of the best films of the decade. Um, and yeah, and it won all of the awards for that year, the Oscars. So I bring this up as an example that storytelling, it's something that's obviously important, uh, whether you're doing it, you know, telling a friend a story at the pub or all the way to the big screen, it can be done well and it can be done poorly, right? Um, but there's a lot of research that goes beyond just entertainment, the role of storytelling and entertainment. So at a cultural level, if you've read Sapiens, the author talks a lot about the role of shared narratives, shared stories in societal development. There's a good deal of neuroscience research about how the brain is structured for narrative thinking, for these sort of pattern making, um, sort of seeing sort of the same kind of patterns and we see the same kinds of stories throughout human history. And also at a community level, so bringing people together to solve problems. Uh, Christiana Figueres in her most recent book talks about this, bringing what are the shared narratives that are going to drive how we solve problems. Uh, when it comes to communication, some of you may or may not be aware of this, but there's lots of evidence supporting storytelling. I mean, I come across these studies all the time and it relates to my own PhD research. Um, here's one just of, uh, this was two months ago that this came out, testing storytelling as a way of engaged people on COVID public health guidelines. And they found rather than just saying, you know, keep a distance, wear a mask, if you have those messages packaged with a, with a story, from emergency room physicians, um, it was much more powerful. And that was a study in the US. Uh, similar studies bridging political divides, climate change communication, health communication. Uh, this paper is a good, it's a little dated, but it's a decent overview of the communications research out there if you're interested. Oh yeah, and I, I also do come across storytelling in the energy research space. So overall, I'd say the literature over the last 10 to 20 years uh, on sort of the science of science communication finds that storytelling makes information more accessible. So if you're speaking with a diverse audience, someone who might not have the expertise in your area, it can sort of lower the barriers to help them engage with your material. It's also more entertaining. Um, there's nothing wrong with making our research and scientific findings more entertaining. It's not an excuse to distort what we know and what we don't know, but there's nothing wrong with making it more fun, right? Um, and it's more persuasive and there's that comes with a bit of responsibility again with science communication, but the evidence is there and something I'm not really speaking about today, but I'm happy to chat with you if you're interested or send you some resources is that stories can also be used as a research method, collecting stories uh, and sort of interpreting them to progress or the actual research itself. So what I'm going to talk to you about, though, is a little bit of a different perspective because there's been all this work around storytelling and I'm sure you've seen sort of storytelling courses and stuff for researchers. But to my own frustration, as obviously you can hear, I'm an American. I used to work in the entertainment industry and I've studied screenwriting for many years and it's sort of a side hobby for me. And it frustrates me that we are as researchers kind of trying to reinvent the storytelling wheel when there are already brilliant experts out there who do this for a living. They know how to tell stories and we should be learning from these artists, not only in Hollywood, which is what I'm focusing on today, but across creative writing, across industries, across cultures. But like I said, I'm going to talk about really American screenwriting principles uh, that I know and I can speak best to. So it's something I've been writing about for the last year or two, um, responding to articles um, from researchers claiming that storytelling is sort of 
unethical or distorts science. And you can read about uh, read that article here if you want to dig into that and my sort of counter response. Uh, and Nature has been taking this seriously as well, and I contributed to this Nature uh, online course on science communication. So the thing is, just to get into this a little bit, that storytelling in science and research are really quite similar. I, I like to talk about Pixar, and this is a book by the founder of Pixar, Ed Catmull. And if you look into how they do it, it's really a science of storytelling. So if you look, this is a picture from the Inside Out writer's room. It's one of my favorite Pixar movies. There's Bill Hader. He plays this character. There's the director. He just came out with that movie Soul, which you might have seen. And if you look at this, it, re it resembles a lab group to me. You have a bunch of people collaborating, running experiments, and they're peer reviewing each other. And they ultimately arrive at these beautiful polished products, much in the way that we arrive with at you know, the final scientific research paper. So for the next 15, 20 minutes, I'm going to give you just a quick sort of flash tour of the kinds of principles that these writers think about when they're in the writer's room. Um, they come from classes I've taken, screenwriting classes I've taken, as well as these kinds of books, the Screenwriting 101 kind of guidelines. And they're not really rules, they're principles. And it's the kind of thing like my, uh, a creative writing teacher I took um, the first thing he told us was you have to know the rules in order to break them. So, of course, there are exception, exceptions to these rules. But, uh, yeah, these are definitely most good film and television, at least in terms of ratings, will abide by at least some of these rules. So, OK, with that said, let's jump in. OK, so at the most basic level, um, why are you telling a story? And it's amazing how often we forget to think about this. Um, if you know someone who just kind of rambles on and on and they kind of don't get to the point of what they're talking about, it's because they haven't thought of, you know, what is the purpose of the story? In the research context, it's really what problem are you trying to solve? And this comes from a Pixar sort of storytelling guideline, uh, guidebook um, that came out. And it's the fairy tale model. It's once upon a time there was blank, every day blank, one day something happened. Because of that, these things happened until finally blank. Essentially, what was the status quo? What happened? And what changed as a result of that occurrence? That's really stories at the most basic level. Now, getting a little bit more into the technical aspects uh, when it comes to writing a script, what is the best way to start your story? You all actually know this if you watch anything on Netflix or really most television, most films, they start with this hook. It's this action-packed scene. You don't really know what's going on. Um, you don't know who the characters are, but it hooks you. And this is across creative writing. Uh, Christopher Nolan does this all the time. And it's really you're opening this question in people's minds What's going on here? I'm going to keep watching this uh, to find out what this is all about. So how do you apply this in a research context? Well, let's say you're giving a presentation, and I see this all the time. Uh, let's say you are a researcher doing uh, sort of ice core research, measuring CO2 concentrations. So oftentimes, scientists have this tendency to start with the big picture. A writer would tell you that's the exact wrong approach. A screenwriter would start with the fieldwork. So especially when you're speaking to people outside your specialty, talk about sort of what you were doing. Don't give it all away yet. So uh, in this case, it would say, here I am, not me. Um, here I am in, in Greenland collecting ice. And then your audience asks, OK, what the heck is this person doing up there? And then you bring in the science. And it's subtle. It doesn't distort the science whatsoever, but it hooks people. It gets them interested. And you can do this, there's all sorts of ways of doing this, even if it's not as dramatic as uh, collecting ice. I do this in all my talks, as, uh, or at least whenever I can. I started with the cats and parasite anecdote, and I could have just started right with my main thesis, but I didn't. And if my theory here is correct, I grabbed your attention from the beginning. Okay, I can take a break from talking for a moment, and I want to show you a quick video um, from the creators of South Park and also the Book of Mormon musical about a principle that they use in their writing. And again, if you guys, uh, if someone doesn't hear, if you don't hear the sound, someone should let me know, please. Don't move. Please welcome the Emmy Award winning and so many creators of South Park, Matt Stone and Trey Parker. 
You think I'm kidding, right? Hey, hey. Our whole South Park writers' room, one whole wall is is one of these, and we've got it split up and in, into three acts. We have and different colored markers, just up. like here too. Look at. Yep. We have that. And I walk around with the markers like this, and we'll go. Okay, we do a show about this. This is, is like, our writers' room. Oh, okay, okay. Well, somewhere. Okay, this would be a funny scene if we had <laughs> this. True. Each individual scene has to work as a kind of funny sketch. You don't want one scene that's just like, well, what, the, what was the point of that scene? We found out this really simple rule that maybe you guys have all heard before, but it took us a long time to learn it. But we can take these beats, which are basically the beats of your outline. And if the words and then belong between those beats, you're f***ed, basically. You got, you got something pretty boring. What should happen between every beat that you've written down is either the word therefore or but. Right. So, so what I'm saying is that you come up with an idea and it's like, okay, this happens. Right. And then this happens. No, no, no. It should be, this happens. And therefore this happens, but this happens. Therefore this happens. And that as soon as we are able to, and literally sometimes we'll, we'll write it out to make sure we're doing it. Uh, we'll, we'll have our beats and we'll say, okay, this happened, but then this happens and that affects this and that does to that. And right. that's why you get a show that feels like, okay, this to that, to this, to that, but this, here's the complication to that. And there's so many scripts we read from new writers and, and, and things that we see. God, I see movies. And, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you see movies that you're just watching. It's like this happened and then this happens and then this happens. That's when you're in a movie just going, what the f am I watching this movie yeah. for? It's just <laughs> yeah. like this happened and then this happened and this happened. That's not a movie. You know, that's not a story. Like Trey said, it's those, those two, but because therefore, that gives you the causation between each beat, and that makes that that's a story. Yeah. Okay, great. So hopefully that's relatively straightforward. It's really thinking about what is the narrative and what information do we need and do we not need. So how do you apply this in a research context? Well, let's say you're uh, writing a research proposal or even a paper, and you often come across abstracts that are sort of research have looked at this, and then they found this, and then we thought about it, and then we realized we could do this, and it just goes on and on. Um, let's, what happens if we use this therefore but principle? Prior researchers have looked at this, but there is this research gap, therefore our study fills this gap by doing this. It's the same information, it's just streamlined. And I was actually just, um, Work. I'm co-author on a paper, and I was sent the draft yesterday. And the literature review was a complete mess. The the it was an accurate sort of description and a good comprehensive look at everything that's been done, but there was no narrative to it. It needed to be pulled together into a story, and so I'm working with them just trying to streamline that. Um, there's a science communication expert named Randy Olson. I just took a course with him. Thought it was great. Uh, he took this but therefore theory and expanded it out into even. Uh, several books on the topic, uh, which I would recommend if you're interested in this. Okay, number four, halfway through now. Um, so the hero's journey, you've probably heard of this. It comes from this uh, guy, Joseph Campbell, who is sort of an, an academic or a psychologist, mythologist. But essentially, it's a complex theory that stories around the world have the same structure. Uh, you don't need to worry about this journey, uh, all the steps in the journey. A lot of writing workshops get into that. Uh, yeah, and it, it inspired George Lucas to write Star Wars uh, directly. Rick and Morty, um, the creator Dan Harmon, relies on his own version of it. Um, the key thing is to think about how do characters change as a result of the story. Good stories, stories that resonate, have character growth. We all know this from what we watch. And this is something I really feel strongly about, and I really feel like this has been ignored. Research fits this model perfectly. So. Um, it, there's this tendency in research, we present what we found, uh, and it's even hard to publish things that were failures, right? Uh, but it, in terms of a story perspective, the human aspects of it, the failures, the mistakes, what you learned, how you grew, how, how your findings changed the way you perceive the world or perceive your research area, that is actually the most fascinating stuff from a story perspective, and we should give that greater attention. I gave this talk a few months ago to Yadvinder Mali's, uh, who's in Oxford, a uh, research professor, um, they, he does ecology work, and there was a group of people in the talk who were writing up a conference proceedings, and they took this hero's journey model that I presented, and they really went overboard with it in a way, uh, but I was so happy to see it that they submitted an article in a story format, and they even commissioned an artist 
to um, do a cover for it. Uh, yeah, so it could have just been a, your standards conference proceedings. We talked about this, we talked about that. But they turned into this mythical thing, and the journal was quite receptive to it. Number five, character flaws. If you attend a workshop in, among writers, uh, if, if you want to know how to create a compelling character, it's always the character flaw. You know, Superman has kryptonite, Indiana Jones, um, snakes, he's afraid of snakes. I just always put new stuff based on what I'm watching on Netflix. Uh, Fleabag, her character is deeply flawed. But the thing is that we actually connect more with characters who have flaws like us instead of these perfect people. Uh, yeah, and as this one Pixar writer put it, you admire a character for trying more than for their successes. Now, tell me that's not a completely different paradigm than the way research works these days, which is just so focused on publishable, sort of groundbreaking results, and it's sort of ignoring that process oftentimes. Yeah, and from my perspective as a PhD student, I would really like to hear more about these career journeys from people who are more advanced than me in their field, in, in my field. Uh, and again, there's also this TED talk from Brené Brown about this being vulnerable is actually a really powerful way of connecting with people. And it makes complete sense. Number six, and don't worry about memorizing all the details of these. It's just giving you an overview. Now, this one's called Save the Cat, and it's a fun one. It's known by a lot of writers, um, but it's a bit controversial. The theory goes that characters we like do some kind of sympathetic action in the beginning of a movie or a TV show. And uh, this is something I constantly see. So uh, Aladdin is one of the cases the book cites on this that I think is a very straightforward example. If you remember the classic scene the first in the animated movie, he steals the bread, he runs from the guards, he sings a song, I think, and perhaps you remember what happens next. He gives the bread to homeless children, and it's like a two-second little clip uh, of him doing that, but uh, apparently the first draft of the movie didn't have that scene. He just stole the bread and ran away, and audiences were like, okay, why am I going to support a common thief for the rest of this film? And they added in this little clip, and it can help sort of get people on board to support your character. Now, that's quite manipulative uh, from writing perspective. Oh, yeah, I do see it. I add clips in all the time. I see it constantly, even in John Wick, which I watched recently, which is a, just a, a really bloody action film. And he, oh, he's a bloody killer, but he loves his dog. Uh, we should support him, <laughs> which is just kind of silly, but it really does work. But I'm not saying you have to do this literally in, in your work, but it's just something to think about um, trying to identify what work are you doing or the sort of projects that you're trying to talk about, what work is empathetic, what work shows that you're doing something good for the world. It's really the impact of your research, right? Um, it's just talking about who's going to benefit from this. And we'll get into this. It, it comes very easily in an ecology conservation uh, subject, um, but there's all sorts of ways of thinking about this. Now, this is one in my own communication roles. I'm helping lots of groups try to think about this. Um, a lot of NGOs do this instinctively, um, but when you're trying to communicate effectively, you don't want to talk about an entire population. You want to start small, talk about that specific person. And you've seen this in television ads from charities and things, right? They tell a specific story. And the science really shows that this works. It's often in psychology, it's called the identifiable victim effect. Showing just one person um, increases people's willingness to sort of expend resources to support a cause rather than talking about the 10 million people who are affected by an issue. A friend of mine does research uh, here at Oxford in, uh, on uh, climate litigation, and he effectively talks about this case about one Peruvian farmer who's suing a German energy company. And that is it's sort of a way of getting people into it. They understand, okay, what is climate litigation? And then you expand out from the specific story of quite a dramatic and interesting character as well. Um, and I thought I'd show you a clip relevant to your work um, with a familiar face that I think gets across the principle quite nicely. Hello, my name's Richard. And my name is Tina, and this is our house, which we've been eco-renovating for the past nine years. Come inside and have a look. Great. I'm not going to show the whole video, but um, yeah, Tina participated in this quick filmmaking uh, project. And instead of just talking about eco renovation in broad brush terms, telling that, like, for people who are unfamiliar with this, seeing, okay, here are two real people who actually did this in their home, that is really effective, powerful storytelling used uh, to communicate, really um, something that gets a little more technical later on. 
Okay, two more. Um, this is something if you've ever attended any writing workshops, of course, you've come across this sort of the three act structure. Don't worry about all these steps. Um, and in fact, a lot of science storytelling workshops get too far into this, in my opinion. The key point is you just want to show why your research matters. And when you feel like you're getting really into the technical details, really try to pull out like, OK, why is this relevant to the overall picture? Um, most movies and television fail in the middle, right? You start watching and then it gets boring and then you quit. Um, so writers are often thinking about how do we keep escalating the action? Um, and that's important for us. So let's continue on from our little abstract we put together, right? So we've identified a research gap. Our study fills this gap by doing this. So once we've done our study, but our results conflict with this theory, these papers, therefore our study has implications for this. And it's just continuing that linear chain of causality to try to really just get to the most important story. What's going on here? Why is it important? Don't think I have time to show this video, um, but uh, there are ways of using humor effectively and some people are more comfortable than others. Um, I think a good strategy if you want to try it is to test it out. You can you know, do a practice presentation or um, in writing it's a little trickier, but uh, the key thing is to be aware of the emotional journey of your work. How are people reacting emotionally? And if it's a really depressing subject, are there ways that you can uh, balance it out, right? OK, so that's the, those, these are the nine principles. And I wanted to show you quickly um, an example of this. So you perhaps saw this about a year or two ago, uh, two years ago, I guess. Um, this Greenpeace Iceland supermarket ad and regardless of how you feel about it, uh, it was a huge success. It was all, it had some issues being banned from television and that even escalated it further, but there was a children's book, 70 million views, petitions about palm oil. And in fact, the science is actually not so clear that we want to ban palm oil, but that's a separate story. Um, so I just want you to watch this ad and see if you can identify any of these principles. There's a rantan in my bedroom, and I don't know what to do. She plays with all my teddies and keeps borrowing my shoe. She destroys all of my houseplants, and she keeps on shouting, ooh. She throws away my chocolate, and she howls at my shampoo. There's a rantan in my bedroom, and I don't want her to stay. So I told the naughty rantan that she had to go away. Oh, rantan in my bedroom, just before you go, why were you in my bedroom? I really want to know. There's a human in my forest, and I don't know what to do. He destroyed all of our trees with your food and your shampoo. There's a human in my forest, and I don't know what to do. He took away my mother, and I'm scared he'll take me too. There are humans in my forest, and I don't know what to do. They're burning it for palm oil. So I thought I'd stay with you. Oh, Rangtan in my bedroom, now I do know what to do. I'll fight to save your home and I'll stop you feeling blue. I'll share your story far and wide so others can fight too. Oh, Rangtan in my bedroom, I swear it on the stars. The future's not yet written, but I'll make sure it is ours. <laughs> It's an effective ad um, from, a, from a story perspective, right? So just to go through. So yeah, there's a clear reason for this story. There's a hook in the beginning, as noted. There's a therefore but quite linear and straightforward. She goes on this journey of discovery. Uh, she has her own flaws. She doesn't realize the damage of her shampoo. Save the cat, she, uh, that's quite apparent. This one I didn't see someone mention, but it starts out with sort of that micro story, the one girl, the one Rantan in her room. Um, and then it expands out to the broader issue. Um, and it just has carries a real punch because of that. Yeah, and the stakes, it's constantly sort of building over time. It even starts off a little funny, right? It's a little quirky in the beginning before it gets too heavy. So that gets, I know that's a completely different context. That's like NGO advocacy work, and that's very different from the work you're doing, but it, I think it gets across some of those principles nicely. So thinking about these principles, a few questions that you can ask yourself or uh, to try to implement them is what is the main problem I'm trying to solve? Why does this research matter? Who's going to benefit from it? Um, why should someone who doesn't work on this care about it? 
uh, who are the main characters that we can identify and maybe use their stories with their permission? And uh, what were the key moments, including the big successes, but also the failures? Uh, and particularly, not just a failure, but something that we learned from, something that we grew from to show why our work is even better because of this experience. Yeah, and thinking about it as not just an outcome, but a research journey.